There's a lot of construction going into this piece, and I have to make sure the bones are strong. Create some type of performance look, but modernize it. This, just that little detail, looks impeccable on this fabric. It's my honor to be here with Academy Award winner and close friend of SCAD, Ruth E. Carter. <laughs> Together, we've had the privilege of viewing and judging the submissions for our SCAD Changemakers Alumni Design Challenge. Tonight, it's time to unveil the winners. <laughs> That's right. And before we announce the winning designs, I must say how proud I am of the SCAD alumni for taking on the challenge. Any historical figure, known or unknown, famous or lost in time, is deserving of honest research. In that study of humanity, a person reveals themselves to you. The more you read, the less blurry the past becomes, like staring through a looking glass of time. And the true beauty of fashion and costuming is telling a detailed story without ever saying a word or making a sound. And in this Change Makers contest, the designs speak volumes. Thank you to all the participants for your artistic integrity and care. And now for the winning designs. Our second runner-up is Mariana Alvarez Zubiaga for the Barlavento Tambor Dancers. Our runner-up is Austin Nelson for Malcolm X. And our winner is Vivian Calvaglio for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Congratulations to every one of you. Keep chasing your inspirations. Continue to explore your creativity and celebrate each day for the joy it gives you. Love the arts and they will love you right back. Thank you, Paula, for inviting me to participate in this. Your students and alumni never cease to amaze me. <laughs> I feel the exact same way. Thank you, Ruth, for your continued mentorship and friendship. The Creative Conversation continues with our next and final SCAD style program, an In Conversation with Justina Blakeney and David Kaufman. To introduce Justina and David, please welcome to the screen SCAD's own Bernardo Coronado Guerra. Take it away, Bernardo. Thank you, President Wallace, and congratulations to the winners of our SCAD Changemakers Alumni Design Challenge. What inspired work? My name is Bernardo Coronado Guerra, and I'm from Executive Administration here at SCAD. Not only that, but I'm also a proud interior design alum. Tonight caps off a great week of SCAD style events. We've heard from so many style innovators, designers, and entrepreneurs, and this evening's program is no exception. I'm thrilled to welcome to the screen Justina Blakeney and David Kaufman. Justina Blakeney is the founder and creative director of Junglo and a New York Times bestselling author. Her latest book, Junglo Decorate Wild, is set to release on April 6th. So get a copy before they're gone. The book will share how Justina creates dynamic junglos, turning homes into kaleidoscopes of color and pattern using inspiration from her own heritage. David Kaufman is the digital director at Architectural Digest and was most recently the founding editor in chief of news.com the search and discovery platform for News Corp. Previously, David worked at the New York Times and spent nearly five years at the New York Post as a resident travel and home and design editor. Now, our guests have years of design, social media, and entrepreneurial experience. So let's get started. So please join me in welcoming Justina Blakely and David Kaufman. Uh, 
Bernardo, thank you. And just, you know, welcome. Um, I'm David Kaufman. As Bernardo said, I'm the Digital Director of Archite Architectural Digest. I'm thrilled to be here with Justina Blakeney to talk about uh, media, social media, making media work, and of course, your new book. Um, Justina, you know, I've been at Arc Digest now for six, six, seven months. And one of the things that was so interesting when I first uh, took this job was that everybody was talking about you in the office. There were, um, <laughs> constantly referring to the, the amazing work that you do, your your, your uh, home projects, obviously, uh, Jungalo, uh, the book you had done, uh, your what your 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 e-commerce uh, uh, operation, all of the various partnerships you have with with big uh, with big companies. Um, so it's like I, I, I I'm it's like we were fated to meet. So I'm thrilled to be speaking with you today. So welcome. Thank you. I'm I'm super excited to be here and thrilled to be in conversation with you. Um, so I'm a lucky person for many reasons. I, you know, have I'm healthy. I have two beautiful children. I have a nice home. But most importantly, I have this book here, <laughs> which is your forthcoming book that's coming out next. I think next week or very soon, uh, April sixth. Uh, Jungalo. Yes, Jungalo Decorate Wild. <laughs> this comes. This book comes after your uh, smash New York Times bestseller, The New Bohemians. Uh, that was a couple years ago, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a bit about where this new book takes takes us in the Justina and the Bungalow journey, the Jungalo journey, and um, really, what is this book about, and how did how did it happen, and how and how is it uh, different and uh, from the previous book? Yeah. So this book has been a long time coming. Um, Jungalo started as a blog um, a little more than 10 years ago, really as a place to chronicle my creative adventures and just whatever I was working on at the time. And now, uh, a decade later, Jungalo is a lifestyle brand and it's known all over the world for this very wild, eclectic, fun, lush, style and um, I really wanted to bring together the stories of what makes Jungalo what it is today and also give people permission to really let loose, let loose, let their wild side fly. I think sometimes design can be intimidating and um, sometimes it can be a little stuffy and a little serious. And I'm interested in letting people know that they can have fun with design and they can tap their own experiences, their own uh, background, their roots, their family, and really create a home that reflects their personality. And that's what I hope I achieved in this book. How much of this book was completed before the, the before the pandemic began? And how did being in quarantine and lockdown, especially in LA where you guys were hit so hard, how did it uh, 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 impact the evolution of this book, if at all? Yeah, so I've been working on this book for almost three years. Um, so it, it has been a, quite a journey. And the book was actually due, the first uh, draft of the book was due two weeks after we went into lockdown. So um, it definitely, uh, when I think back on this year, I think in the future, it's going to have a lot to do with this book because um, my husband wrote the book with me and um, my daughter ended up helping, she's eight, <laughs> with the last photo shoots for the book that we had to change locations of and really uh, pulling all-nighters towards the end of the deadline to make sure that we got the book in right as the pandemic was starting to happen. So it was very intense. And then also completing the book, because once a book is handed in, there's a long editing process that takes place. And, um, and not really having the ability to do any reshoots or mm. or go back and 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 revisit certain things that we might have revisited was challenging. Um, however, I think be, being home all the time, um, the the writing in the book I think really benefited from that because there were just so many long nights that my husband and I spent sort of going back and forth and really massaging the text and really making it I think shine. And um, so, of course, you know, the pandemic has been crazy and difficult for, for all of us. And I think I've been really privileged in this scenario to be able to work from home um, and everything else. But um, but I think ultimately, I think the book is probably better because of it, because we had so much more time. You spoke uh, earlier about um, 
having a philosophy in a way of allowing people to embrace their own design aesthetic, their own design inspiration and journeys. How does Jungalo do this differently than the New Bohemians? And, and what do you hope people will learn from you in, from this book and, and also learn from themselves? So Jungalo is a much more personal book than the New Bohemian series. Um, in that series, we really went into other people's homes and tried to figure out how they were living and how they were using their own creative inputs and expressing that in the way that they live and in the way that they decorate. And instead in this book, it's really about my journey to getting to where I am and my philosophy. And then with the hopes that sharing this gives people uh, the understanding or a little bit of a jumping off place to be able to do the same for themselves. One of the things I always admire about people like you is that you are able to, you know, make a living from your creativity, which I think is the ultimate, you know, human goal, basically. Um, when, was there a moment, say a decade ago, or a little bit more where you said, um, okay, I can take this blog, my creativity, my inspirations, and make it into a profession and make, make you know, make, make some money out of it. Was there an aha moment? And, um, and if so, what was it? And more importantly, um, do you feel like you could finally exhale? Are you finally there where you wanted to be? <laughs> creating a business for yourself. So I think there, there wasn't one big aha moment like, woo, I, I'm there, I'm, I'm rich, I'm, I'm fulfilling all of my things. It's, it's so much for me, at least, it's so much more of just a journey and a practice. And whether it's entrepreneurship or being an artist or a designer or just expressing my creativity in, in all these different manifestations, whether it's for the book or the blog or my e-com shop, um, for me, it's, it's, it's a little bit every day and it's growing a little bit every day and being flexible to embrace success and follow follow those successes in that trajectory and to also let go of things that aren't necessarily working. I always, uh, it, it's, it's not so much that I always uh, was sure I would be able to make a career out of being creative, but um, I, I, it sort of got to the place where I had to do this. I had to be my own boss. I had to express myself. I had to do it. And and even if I ended up just being broke and and living in a tiny apartment and, and doing it or or being successful, it sort of didn't matter. I just that's what I needed to do. Was there something early on, looking back now, was there something early on that you did uh, a smart business move or a partnership or aligning with somebody that that you say you can look back and say that doing that um, helped ensure that I got to where I am today. Was there, was, was there a move that you made that as a, as a young, as a young entrepreneur that really sort of set you up for, for that kind of security? Yeah. So one thing I've always been really, uh, cautious about is putting too many eggs in a singular basket. And so I can give you a few examples of that. Mm -hmm. Um, when, Pinterest first landed on the scene and it was, you know, everyone was super excited about Pinterest. <laughs> um, I, I garnered a large following on that platform and had over a million followers there. And I had a lot of friends who were kind of in the industry who were also pinners and, you know, large followings. And um, I never rested on that. I, I sort of looked at the trajectory of some of the other social media platforms and some of the influencers that were on those platforms and realized that I wasn't in control of the narrative on that platform. I don't own that. So I really consciously started funneling that audience back to my blog. And then when Instagram was on the scene, same thing for me, diversification and making sure that I don't get too comfortable um, in one certain arena, but that I'm always planting different seeds and watering them and nourishing them and making sure different things sprout and grow. Um, that was a hugely important thing for me. And I think had I not done that, there's no way I could have created what now is, is Jungle Up. So today, while I was supposed to be working, I spent a lot of time deep into Jungalo and your own personal Instagram accounts, which are so fun. It's great, Thank it's great you to see, you know, everything you're working on and doing. And but I know that you know, to the untrained eye, being in being in digital media, 
I know to the untrained eye, it can look you know simple and effortless and easy breezy. What what is the operation? How many people are are you are, are on your team to kind of you know you have over a million Instagram followers on Jungle, almost half a million on your own account. So what does it take to maintain that? Because there's a lot of content on there and a lot of content coming out every single day. Yeah, it's a lot for sure. Um, and I have 11 full time people on my team. That's with everything. Um, and another large handful of uh, freelancers that we work with as well. So there are a lot of people helping me behind the scenes. I'm not doing everything on my own. Um, and I also I think the thing with social media, and I think one of the main reasons I've I've seen success with it and been able to grow my channels the way I have is that I love it. I love connecting with my community and building community and exchanging information and sharing. And I think it's really the pa passion is the fertilizer to use another plant metaphor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's there's definitely a lot going on behind the scenes to try and create um, fun, exciting, engaging content that stops people in the scroll. Yeah, at the same time, you're also writing books. You're you have all these partnerships with you know pretty major retailers. Um, I guess my question for you is: we talk a lot uh, at AD with various designers, and, and as, as part a lot of uh, some of our business events with designers, we talk about growth. Um, and, and managing growth and growing s smartly, as opposed to growing, you know, as former President Trump would say, bigly. Um, <laughs> your approach to growth, and, and where are you right now, and where might you want to see yourself in the, in the next few years? That's a great question, um, especially because with where I am at my with my business right now, and I currently own 100% of my business, and have started having people reach out, maybe wanting to be a part of it in one way or another, um, trying to decide how big do we want to get and and what is sort of the ultimate goal, which sometimes just being in the business in the day to day, you don't take time to zoom out and say, OK, what is the 10 year goal or the 20 year goal or where do I want to take this thing? Um, and so that is something I'm thinking a lot about right now. And I think ultimately, um, slow, sustainable growth is the kind of growth I'm interested in and the kind of growth that um, allows me to explore what I love, which is creativity and community and trying to do things in a way that I feel good about. Those are all really important to me. And that's uh, that's where I lead from. And then the other things that happen and, and sort of nourish and help the company grow are almost... Um, floating on top of that. So um, I don't necessarily say, oh, I want to be the next anthropology or I want to be the next, you know, whatever. For me, it's really more about I want to do what I love every day with people I love to work with. And um, I want to do it in a way that I feel good about. And if I can sustain that and if we're growing in doing that, then great. And um, so that's my philosophy with that. <laughs> Forgive me for getting too, uh, you know, mushy, touchy, feely, but what does it feel like to have somebody with a lot of money and a lot of resources come to you and say, we, we want to invest in you. We, we, we love what you're doing. We believe in you. What's that feel like for a creative person? To, to have oh, I mean, it's obviously flattering. It's, it's definitely flattering. It's a nice little ego stroke. Um, and at the same time, I, um, I think money is great. I love money, <laughs> but I've never been, um, I, I never lead with that. That's not, that's not, the heart center of the business for me. Um, and so I think I have to make those decisions very carefully about how I invite um, those types of resources into the business because um, I like to do things my way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is so- there, Is there a sort of like one sentence that could describe the Justina Blake Blakeney way of, of, of running her business? Um, heart led. Heart led. Heart led. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, when in the book, you have a, a line that we kind of like, we, we all love. Interiors should reflect who you are, where you've been, and how you want to live. So, you know, tell us just a bit about how this happened. You're like me, you're from Northern California, from, I'm from San Francisco, you're from across the Bay. We're both from uh, mixed Jewish and African American families, which obviously makes us awesome. Uh, <laughs> you know, okay, but then, so you you went to, I think you went to, to Berkeley 
if I'm correct, or UCLA, mm -hmm. UCLA, which is UCLA, and you graduated and you studied in Europe. And what happened? How did this happen? So yeah, I studied in Europe. I opened a boutique in Italy that I ran with my sister, Faith, who's also a designer. Uh, we did that for about five years. And um, I'm just a design obsessed person and art and have been for as long as I can remember, just loved all things creative, all things art related. When I got back stateside, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, know, I knew that I wanted to do something creative. So I just started kind of helping people in different ways. Um, small business owners, I would just take up anything, whether it was designing a logo or an apartment or um, designing websites, all that kind of stuff. I was sort of a creative freelancer for hire. And in that way, I got to hone in on the stuff that I really liked to do. And it was also around that time that I started the blog. And I sort of had this very clear idea that if I was able to build an audience, um, I could sort of do whatever I wanted. <laughs> I was seeing that happen with other sort of celebrities or influencers where they would just build an audience and then they could, oh, I don't know, come out with a pantyhose line or, <laughs> you know, open a boutique hotel or whatever they wanted to do. So I, I thought to myself, let me see, see if I can build a community around what I love and then I'll be able to do whatever I want to. And so I set out to do that and somewhat miraculously <laughs> it worked. <laughs> One of the things that uh, you're you know, quite noted for are the partnerships you've had with some relatively big companies, Target, Pottery Barn, Anthropology. Um, first, I want to ask, how do, how do those kinds of, especially for young designers or designers who are in, in mid-career who, who, who see that as sort of like you know, a pipeline to financial security and, 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 and greater prominence, um, how do those kinds of partnerships happen? You know, do you go to them? Do they go to you? Uh, how, and also, how much time does this take? How, for, as a creative person, how do you ensure that um, these kinds of business pursuits, because they're important and, and they're really good for, you know, really essential for a long lasting career. How do you, how do you ensure that th these business pursuits don't overtake your creativity? Hmm, that's a great question. I, I think for me, um, well, I'll say that I first started doing these types of collaborations in 2015, which was around the time that the new Bohemians launched. And I was really focused on building my platform at the time. And the book really helped with that a whole lot. And then once I sort of that became a New York Times bestseller and I had a large audience on some of these social media platforms, um, we sort of realized we could parlay that into licensed collaborations. And so um, I got a licensing agent who's still my licensing agent today. And her name is Kim and she's amazing and specializes in home. And at the time it was pretty interesting because there were a lot of these types of collaborations happening, but they were mostly just happening with very traditional interior designers, not necessarily people who um, you know, had large social followings or, or anything like that. And I think I was really one of the first um, sort of influencers in the design space to um, kind of dig my hands into the sort of like high point designer universe. And I think that really served me well because it was around the same time that people were sort of starting to wake up to the power of social media. But a lot of people in the design industry hadn't yet um, harnessed that. And so um, really being ahead of the curve, I think, was quite helpful at that stage. And so um, starting to do these collaborations, uh, I really learned that one of my deepest passions is product design and surface pattern design. Mm -hmm. And so I really love designing all the rugs that I have with Loloi and wall coverings and fabrics with Valdez Weavers and, and creating all these um, all these products really lights me up and sort of allows me to practice all the things that I love to practice from a creative standpoint. Um, I don't necessarily feel that it drains me creatively. I feel that it fuels me, but we are very selective with the partners that we take on and don't do too many at once. And that's how I sort of put guardrails around my bandwidth. Who are you working with right now or who can we look forward to? So right now we have collections with, Loloi Rugs, Valdez Weavers, Peking Handcraft for bedding, and um, I think, and then we have some lifestyle products out right now under the Jungle of Brands. So we have a personal care line with Native that's at Target, and we have a lot of really exciting stuff coming out very soon. 
and, and obviously, <laughs> obviously there's a big difference between sort of partnering with a big brand and, and doing these products on your own. What was it like for you, like, you know, you talked about these these products under the Jungle O brand. Obviously, you have to not just design them, but get them manufactured and get them distributed, and you know help, help with promotion. So help with promotion. So what is what's the big the biggest difference you know for you as as a creative in doing your own branded products and working with a partner? Um, you know, there's pluses and minuses to both things, and I think really if you find the right partners, then doing licensing is incredible. Um, obviously when we're producing our own stuff, the profit margins are much larger. So there's sort of a larger piece of the pie that you can earn, but you're also putting a lot more work in. Mm -hmm. And so it's really just, I think about finding the right balance, um, having some partners that do some of the heavy lifting for you, and then also doing some stuff yourself so that your financial situation works out, mm -hmm. but also, um, you're not necessarily spreading you or your team too thin from the standpoint of uh, production and following uh, manufacturing and all that, which is a, a big, a big thing, <laughs> a big headache. <laughs> yeah. And has this, has this partnership or product uh, component of, of Jungle um, how is the, how has the, um, the pandemic impacted that? Have things, has, has it been more work, less work? We spoke with a few designers a couple of weeks ago, one of our AD panels, and they were saying that the partnership component of their of their practices has actually grown substantially during, 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 during COVID. Yeah, so, I mean, the home industry in general has seen a bump uh, for, I think, so many reasons. If you follow the stock market at all, you can see all the home stocks are, you know, soaring right now. And, um, and so we've definitely experienced that as well. And then on the flip side, we've also experienced a ton of delays and um, cancellations with things that were, um, you know, trying to get basically stateside things that we produce mostly in India. Um, we do a lot of our textiles in India and there's just been a lot of delays. Some things are delayed six to nine months delays. So trying to figure out how to create a balanced, exciting assortment for our community while also experiencing all these delays. And sometimes, you know, they'll ask us if we want to rush a shipment, but it all cost, you know, 60, 70 percent more <laughs> shipping and just making all these kinds of decisions on the fly um, has been a real challenge. Um one thing where I'm very curious about, you know, creative people like you is that, especially designers, because so much of the design world is about traveling to places, of course, meeting in person, exchanging ideas, and we've all been home for the last year. I mean, I think, you know, most of us have barely ventured, you know, a mile away from, you know, our, our home bases. So how have you stayed inspired during this period? And how have you kept your creative juices um, uh, inspired? So nature is my number one way to stay inspired. And luckily that wasn't cut off from us during this time. So going out into nature, taking hikes, even just walks around my own neighborhood, I still feel really inspired just by getting outdoors. So that's number one. Number two is that I'm a total magazine freak <laughs> and I love magazines. I, I get them from all over the world and um, also was really lucky and had someone DM me on Instagram whose dad was an architect and they were getting rid of about a dozen boxes of vintage design magazines. And so I've been savoring them. They're mostly from the seventies. And when I'm really feeling like low on inspo, I dive into these vintage 30 year old, 40 year old magazines and get fueled up. <laughs> yeah. I actually wanted to ask you about uh, your relation, your real sort of relationship with social media, because one of the things now that I'm sort of, you know, helping to oversee our social media at AD, you know, you read the comments and you take them personally and you sometimes feel, you know, thrilled and you feel so, so happy that people have taken such an interest and have, have received such pleasure and um, not just pleasure, but um, a sense of hope and well-being from the things you're putting online. But of course, sometimes you have folks not saying such such nice things about your content. So, do you do you make a habit of responding to as as many as many DMs as, as or comments or DMs as possible? Like, what what is your strategy behind that? Because you can't necessarily respond to them all, but you know, in a way, that is how your brand is evolving. So, what's your strategy around around uh, communicating with with folks via social media? So, I have sort of different policies for the different channels that I run because we've got my own personal Justina Blakeney, we've got Justina Blakeney Home, and then we also have the Jungalo. 
And my current policy is that I respond to questions. So if there is a question, I try to get to it. Um, I don't always get to it, especially if someone's asking a question a long time after I've posted. It's sort of like, okay, sorry, can't keep up. Um, but I also just check my own personal energy level. And this is something that I've had to learn over the years with having a large audience is that I can't please everyone. And that um, when it's fun, it's fun. But when it's not, then I got to turn it off and <laughs> get back to my real my real world life and my family and my child and all that. So um, if I do feel like social media is depleting my energy, I will just turn it off and take a little break. But otherwise, I, I usually do really enjoy it. And I really enjoy being in conversation with my community. And it, 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 be, along with the example you gave of the, of the family that gave you all those great magazines, um, has your, you know, sort of personal life been impacted by folks who've reached out to you and who've sort of offered, you know, interesting opportunities that you haven't thought of? And, and if so, share them with us, please. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, my life has just changed so much because of social. It's almost hard to differentiate at this point. Um you know, what came from that or just came from a real life connection, real life. Um, but I think maybe a, a really great example is, um, gosh, it's probably about five years ago now, I had a woman reach out to me and um, she was interested in working together. And um, so we had a phone chat, we hit it off and she's been working with me for the last five years. Her name is Christina. She runs our e-com operation. And that was just a great, example of a DM turning into this incredible real life relationship. Now, how often do you post on your personal account? What's your sort of you know, intention around that? And you know, do, you, do, you, do you get up in the morning and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post something like this? And then you, you plot it out? Do you storyboard it? Or are you more kind of just organic and free and say, here's my vibe right now. I'm just going to put it out there. I am more organic and free on <laughs> Justina Blakeney. I think there was a point where I was trying to post every day. Mm -hmm. um, I think during the pandemic and just in general, I, I now have a different philosophy where I only want to post when I'm really excited about what I'm posting. I don't want to force myself to post something just to post something. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's what I do. If I have something exciting to share, I'll share it. And um, otherwise, I'm okay to have a comma or a little pause and not post for a few days. That's okay too. Do people, if you don't post for a few days, do people notice? Are you people reaching out and saying, you know, yo, where are you? Uh, no, not, not really. I oh. think they're like, oh, we get it. You got stuff to do. <laughs> and how do you, how do you, I mean, what is your sort of thinking behind maintaining sort of a public and private wall on your own personal Instagram? Because I, I noticed that there weren't that many photos of, of your family, for instance. Like, so mm -hmm. how do you kind of negotiate that kind of public private sphere on your, on your personal account? So when my daughter was born um, almost nine years ago, my husband and I talked about it. I didn't have the platform I had now, but it was already sort of starting to be effervescent. And so we had this discussion around sort of what that would mean. And we agreed that we wouldn't um, use her in posts that were sort of sponsored or, or anything like that. And that we would sort of respect her privacy um, just as a person. And so um, now that she's sort of old enough to like check my Instagram and like know what's going on, it's it's really um, posting when she kind of wants it or is excited to. And, and we both sort of are excited to share something. Um, and my husband's a pretty private person. So he, you know, just kind of likes to be in the background a little bit more. Um, but it's really, again, heart led. It's really about what feels comfortable and feels good and, and what we're excited to share. So my dad loves being featured on my Instagrams. <laughs> it's like, I love posting pictures of my dad. He thinks it's really fun. So yeah, it's really about what lights me up and what lights people up. And I think it's it was great that my husband and I had really clear um, agreement around right. sort of what we would feel comfortable with from the outset so that every time an opportunity came by, it wasn't like, oh God, this is a lot of money. Should we do this? It was like, no, we already decided we're not doing that's off, that. That's off the table. Right. And, and, and what is your daughter... What does she think you do all day? I mean, she's obviously a kid, and but she's, you know, as I'm learning as a dad, these kids are really 
digital savvy and mine, mine are quite, quite a bit younger than yours. So what's, what does she think is happening all these days while mom's, you know, creating content both for uh, social media and, and, and your, and, and, and the blog and, and the books. How does She's she engage with all this? Super plugged in. She knows exactly what's going on. She even like, likes to help and you know knows how to use photoshop now because she watches me work all the time and so yeah she knows exactly what's going on mama's a designer mama has a book coming out like she's she's all up in it <laughs> now you've obviously made your mark um in social media um we could we could call you an influencer though not every influencer loves that term um i don't but hey <laughs> What about traditional media, like people like us uh, at Condé Nast and Art Digest? What has been your relationship in terms of working with the the the, 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 tr the traditional press, the legacy press? How important, even because you have such a huge audience and people are essentially engaging with you every single day, or with your products, or with you know with your uh, Jungleo Instagram account? How important is traditional media for what you do? How do you get it? And um, and um, how do, how's, it, how's it impacting your career? I feel like I should ask you that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, look, I feel like I've been so fortunate over the years to have received a lot of incredible press from traditional media. And I felt like and continue to feel like it's important uh, for clout, for, um, you know, starting out as a blogger or as an influencer or, or something like that. I often felt like I wasn't taken seriously as a designer. And so having certain press accolades on my portfolio, I think has been important to help me get a book deal or get some of these partnerships. I think traditional media is still really important to my partners. Um, and I think it's great to balance new media with uh, traditional media. And so do you have a do you have a public do you have a personal publicist? So yeah, I do have a, a publicist that I work with. I work with LaRue PR, they're incredible. Um, and I first started working with them when I was releasing the first book. Right. Um, I sort of understood that in order to make a book do what you work so hard for it to do, getting, uh, getting PR for that is extremely important. And so, um, yeah, I do work with them and we're also, uh, always pitching and coming up with different ideas. And because I, I kind of came up in the blogosphere, the way I approach everything is in a very narrative way. So when I'm designing a room or even a product, um, I'm thinking about the story and the story behind it the whole time. So right. that, you know, by the time, and I'm sharing and I'm sharing peaks and, and little tidbits and things like that to really bring people into the fold and, and make people be part of the process. I think that's really important so that by the time that the story does come out or the book or the product does come out, people already feel really invested. One of the things that you're, you're extremely noted for is your love and embrace of color. Um, when you first first kind of you know burst on the scene, you know, we were still in this very modernist movement with clean lines and very simple shapes and simple styles. And you were like, no, I'm all about color. So a few questions. What color are you really into right now? What color are you thinking about these days and why? I just can't shake green. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just, uh, and, and oftentimes my, gr my greens have a lot of blue. So it's like a teal or, you know, a cerulean kind of blue. I mean, you can actually see that in my, my walls, but, um, I, I just find that that color really, uh, it really makes me feel all the things I want to feel. <laughs> Do you find that folks are in some ways still sort of intimidated, intimidated by color that they don't, they don't think, they don't think that they know how to use it? I do. I do think that. And I actually talk a lot about color. There's a whole chapter on color in the new book. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear it all the time. People are scared to, you know, mix color or or use bold color on furnishings or while they're afraid they're going to get tired of it. Um, and it's funny because I get so tired of plain things. I'm like, I don't know why you wouldn't think that you might get more tired of something colorful than something that's all white, but you know, we're all different. <laughs> so. Have we moved, have we kind of moved beyond this this modernist mid-century moment? Do you think or are we still kind of mired in? Are you still struggling to help to help color break free? 
I, I think it's start, I'm definitely starting to see more people and more designers and just everyday folks embrace color. So that's been really refreshing to see. Um, and just like, I, I, I love all the colors. I love, I think everything can be material. Everything can be um, a, a surface with which you can express your creativity and, and kind of put your stamp on something and make it fun. So I, I do think that we're moving in a good direction of, of people being able to feel a little more free when it comes to design and, and how they create their homes. And I think that's important. Let's talk about the word jungalo, which I love. Tell us about how that word came to you and what it means to you. And, and also, you know, who who's the jungalo reader out there? So the word came um, when I had just moved back to Los Angeles after having lived in Italy and New York for almost a decade. And I had for the first time in a little apartment all on my own and I had never lived by myself before. And it was botanical wallpapers um and tons of plants and i was there with some girlfriends who were visiting from new york and they said oh my gosh i love how california has all these cute little bungalows it's, it's so cute i love it and yours is like a jungle it's like a jungle bungalow mm -hmm. and it was like done jungle um and and i just heard it and grabbed onto it because I loved it and loved the way it sort of felt in my mouth it's very bouncy and it's a fun word and um and so, yeah, then it was just like done. That's what I was going to call my blog, my brand, the whole thing. There was a part B to the question. It was the oh, part B. For the book, who do you, who do you sort of see as the Jungle oh. reader? And, and also, how does that reader, how does that reader of Jungle differ from the New Bohemians reader? Or is, or is they just growing along with you? Yeah, I think it's a similar, it's a similar reader. Um, I think it's really someone who is maybe interested in design and, and, and art and um, nature, wants to learn maybe a little bit about plants, a little bit about patterns, how to mix patterns, how to make patterns. Um, and, and really it's about letting yourself run a little bit wild in, in home decor. And so anybody who's interested in freeing themselves up to experiment a little bit in their homes. I think they'll they'll love this book. One of the things we've seen at Art Digest is over the last year, you know, the home has, for obvious reasons, become the center point of everybody's lives. And we've now the home is doing, you know, double and triple duty. And we've found ourselves creating spaces and taking on activities in the home that we never thought we would. Are there any sort of interesting sort of spaces you've created in your home during quarantine or some things you found yourself doing in your house that you never could have imagined that you'd be doing um, at this at this point in your life? Oh, gosh. I mean, when we were finishing the book and doing shoots and I had my eight-year-old holding up the scrim for lighting and, and doing all that, I just didn't anticipate that's what was going to be uh, happening. So that was pretty crazy. But I think like everyone, our home um it has just been everything for us it's the gym it's the art studio it's the office um it's the school you know it's the disco <laughs> it's like it's everything um and i think for us and especially being living in los angeles where we have you know pretty nice weather and we can kind of embrace the indoors and the out the way we're using our outdoor spaces has also really changed because it's it's like the way we go out we're just going out into our backyard and so we just spent so many so much time out there i have an outdoor shower and i live in my outdoor shower i'm like all about hydrotherapy um and and kind of feeling refreshed and feeling the sun on my face and the wind and just cleansing in that way but yeah i mean home has been so important this year. Are there elements of your business that have had to evolve during COVID that you feel are going to be lasting evolutions? What are some of the changes you see to the whole jungle empire because of COVID? Well, you know, I was just, we had our staff meeting just before this and we were just talking now that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, whether or not we're going to be working out of our offices again, because we still haven't, um, we still have our offices, but you know, for the most part, we haven't been working out of them. And so um, we started during the pandemic with five employees. Now I have 11 and we won't actually all fit at the studio together. And so I think that our move to uh, work from home, at least in part is going to be a permanent 
move. So um, we'll probably have a hybrid work week where some people are going in on certain days. And I think that's going to be permanent, which is a huge change from us all, you know, being in one space together, you know, from nine to five, five days a week. Do you feel that the exchange of ideas, the exchange of creativity can be just as strong in this model? Um, I, I really am excited to get back to the office and have, I really miss interacting with my team and having that exchange of ideas in person. I think that given the situation, um, working remotely has worked fine, but, um, I think when it comes to what we do and, um, with so many creative projects going on at once and, oh, which one of these do you like? And da, 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 you know, like having that banter and, and, and just being together is important. So I wanna make sure that we're at least getting some of that back. Um, we mentioned earlier on that you come from a, you know, unique eclectic background like I do. And I just wanted to ask, and you speak about this in your previous book about having a mixed uh, African-American and Jewish background that it's really impacted your creativity, your, your sense of bohemianness. How has having that mixed background kind of shaped your uh, aesthetic journey and your design journey? Well, I talk about this so much in the first chapter of the new book, which is called Magic in the Mix. And it really has, I think, greatly uh, affected my personal aesthetic and the way that I feel comfortable mixing things that don't conventionally go together. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So um, growing up, we did a lot of traveling and you know, brought stuff back from different places and had Japanese shoji screens on our kitchen. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. Second. <coughs> I'm like, <coughs> I'm like, how do I mute? <laughs> I it's, this is not Zoom, so I don't know. <laughs> well, while giant, while Sheena's getting herself together, I just want to show her book one more time. Here it is. Here's the other side. It's very cool and very beautiful. And I've been looking at it every single day since I got it. Uh, my mom's looked at it and the kids love it too. <laughs> Thanks for the commercial. I'm all good. good. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, growing up both, we really celebrated both cultures that we came from. And that was really expressed in African artifacts that my dad collected. We had Ethiopian paintings on the wall and so many West African masks and also so many Jewish cultural items, whether it was the mezuzah on our door or the Havdalah candles and celebrating Shabbos and all the stuff that goes along with all that. So growing up in an environment like that in Berkeley, where sort of celebrating your culture and there were a lot of other mixed kids, it was just sort of I was there. <laughs> <laughs> it gave me permission to, to mix things up. Mm -hmm. And and so one of the things that I talk about in the book is how you can give yourself permission to do that, too. And so for me, the combination of my heritage, my roots um, and what I call in the book adventitious roots, which are the sort of the roots and the plant that go out and, and seek nutri nutrients from the soil around them. I think of that as travel and of meeting people and sharing stories and gleaning inspiration and bringing that back into the fold as well. And have your parent, has your family been um, supportive at every step? Has there, you know, there was a long time when I was uh, you know, a very kind of busy money earning freelance writer, but when <laughs> I finally got a job, my mom was like, he got a job. So was there, <laughs> Was there a period where you know your family has your family always been supportive along this journey, or were there periods that you might have felt a bit of pressure to have a more conventional, uh, professional lifestyle? No, my my family has always been one hundred percent supportive of of every creative, uh, crazy thing I've ever tried. Um, so I really have to give my parents props for that. I feel like I was very nurtured and and supported even when I was like, I wanna to move to Italy. I wanna open a store there. I wanna try this, I wanna try that. It was always like, how can we help? So yeah, I was very, very lucky in that regard. So one of the things we have to ask, you know, as you know, you're very much embedded in um, 
you know, the power and um, the visibility of social media. And this is a, you know, this is a time now, particularly following um, what happened with George Floyd in the summer and the recent, um, uh, you know, spate of anti-Asian violence. Um, there's a lot of um, expectation that people in the spotlight on social media will make statements, will uh, declare uh, allegiances to causes. How have you negotiated this 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 period? Um, in terms of your own social media content around um, progressive or social justice charge uh, causes, because you know if you get it wrong, you know people are, people will let you know very quickly, and will 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 take the will take that getting wrong to very high level. So, what's it been like trying to navigate this world of of, of progressive protests and social justice as as an internet um, you know design star in a way? Um, yeah, it's challenging. I think it's challenging, just like it's challenging to negotiate that in real life and all the feelings around it and um, the feelings of helplessness, uh, the feelings of fear. Um, and and so, you know, earlier I said that I'm very heart led when it comes to how I run my business. and. I try to do the same thing um, on social and especially when it comes to these types of issues, I try and be heart led as well. One thing that I have as a policy is that I will never talk about something without sort of walking the walk as mm -hmm. well. So I won't ask somebody, oh, you guys should donate to X or Y if, if I haven't donated or mm, oftentimes my policy would just be to share what I'm doing. Um, as opposed to saying, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's how I navigate that. And um, I do think it's important to speak out. I, I do think it's important to um, to support the causes that I believe in and to not be quiet about it. And so that's what I do. We're going to have to uh, wrap up our portion quite soon. But I also want to ask, um, as a woman of color and a man of color in, in industries that have traditionally been quite white. Do you feel that we're at a moment of real change? Do you see the change? Do you feel the change? Are you optimistic? You know, it's funny that you say that because I told you I'm a magazine junkie. So I went and got my fix on Tuesday. I went to the magazine stand and bought, you know, the, all the ones I buy, the ADs, the El Decors, the uh, also a lot of the business magazines, the entrepreneur, fast company, all that stuff. And, um, there were black folks on almost every single cover. And I can tell you that is, as my dad would say, rare as frog hair. <laughs> so, um, I do see incremental change happening um, and it's gonna take time. And I know because I work with a lot of large retailers that a lot of people have plans in place to kind of really start nourishing more black creatives, more black women, all this kind of stuff. It's gonna take time, but I, I have started to see it and it is really refreshing and so overdue. Wonderful, um, I, we're, we're getting clues that we have to wrap up, but I wanna ask you one final question. <laughs> what is <laughs> the, the one product, the one thing that you still hope one day to design? What is it? I wanna design a hotel. Great. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be your first I'll be your first guest for sure yes you will be <laughs> but you got to give me the ad cover <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that we'll work on that we'll do a trade <laughs> well fantastic well now checking into that hotel I'll be the second one David I'll okay. be after you so <laughs> thank you both so much truly for being a part of this conversation we're, we're so honored to have you um, now we're just going to move on to some questions from our audience so again audience members if you have any questions keep typing them in and we'll try to get the best questions through, okay? So our first question comes from Dina, and it asks, do you have any advice on how to build a creative lifestyle brand when social media feels overwhelming? Yeah, social media is overwhelming, and I think when you wanna build a, a lifestyle brand, you have to figure out um, what your niche is who your, who your audience is, where your community lives. And then you really have to focus and quiet all those other voices and really not necessarily focus too much on the competition. And I think that is, you, you, you gotta do you, right? And if you have something 
um, amazing. And if you're consistent and, and, and not just consistent on doing your thing, but also in sort of building your community around it. So commenting, sharing, bringing other people into the fold as well, then I think you can quiet some of the noise that, that uh, is so ubiquitous on social. You got to do you. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> I, I think I'm just going to uh, maybe needlepoint that one. It's, it's what? <laughs> you to you, boo. You to you. <laughs> uh, this one is coming from Instagram. So um, obviously for, for both of you, um, how do you find and budget for good PR? Yeah, I mean, I'll take a first stab at this <laughs> and just say that um, Jesse from LaRue PR, who I work with, had um I, I met her because she had been pitching me on on the influencer side of things with products and i felt that she always did a great job at pitching and that she understood my flavor and the kind of things that i liked to feature on the blog and so when it got time to find somebody i sort of went to her because i i knew she she got me um Budgeting is a whole other story. <laughs> it but can it definitely be expensive, um, but especially with an e-com brand, PR is just so important that you have to figure out how to carve the budget out for it. Beautiful. David, anything that you want to add on that one? Or? Uh, you know, I think she, I think she uh, okay. pretty well. Nails it on. Okay. Perfect. And I think we have time for just one more. I'm looking at this. Um, this one's come, coming from Amira. So what was that big aha moment that made you believe that you were doing the work you were always meant to do? The big aha, you know, it's funny. People always want to know what this like big yeah. moment is. But I, really, yeah. I don't think that that is necessarily for me how it is. It's in the work in the everyday. Mm -hmm. um, and it's following a path and just, seeing the little signs that show you that you're on the right path. Wow, I love it. Perfect. Thank you. Well, um, that's it for, for the time that we have. Thank you, Justina. Thank you, David, and everyone who has joined us for Scat, Scat, Scat Style 2021. I hope you left inspired and because, well, we all know that we, we all sure did. So thank you so much. Um, just a friendly reminder, see you all at Scat Gaming Fest on April 9th and 10th. And good night, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This was so well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.